Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much for uh, coming along tonight. And it's great to be here. We've put together a special session for you. The title of the, the, the program is called You Are the Difference. That's the name of the program. It's the name of my company. And it's about empowering and leading a first class service culture. So you will all get copies of this uh, slides as well. So we'll, we'll organ we're going to organize that for you. So there's me. My name is Alf Dunbar. I've got a little bit of a Scottish accent. Can you hear it? Yeah. Just a tiny bit. Um, <clears throat> I used to live in Scotland. I now split my time between Cork and in Copenhagen. I'm going down to Cork tomorrow. So I'll be there for about a week. And by the end of next week, I'll be going up at the end of my sentence. You all right, boy? So <laughs> it just kind of comes on like that. Um, I've been uh, involved with You The Difference. I created it uh, over 25 years ago, this year, 25 years this year. And prior to that, I worked for uh, 12 years on the shop floor as a manager. Um, and that's where we spend most of our working life on a shop floor. That's what we do. So we call it YATD for short. So what is You Are The Difference? What is it? Well, You Are The Difference was developed on a shop floor. It impacts on how people think about service. It creates positive buzz. It helps create new skills, builds confidence, and you come. And it produces positive results. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where it came from. I think it's important you understand a little bit of my background and where it was created. Can I just say that I'm going to condense the story because it's all in my book that you're going to get a copy of. But nothing I tell you now is made up for effect. This all happened. It's all true. So over 25 years ago, I was living in Scotland and my partner I was Danish and she was expecting uh, our daughter Lisa. She wanted to have the baby in Denmark. So I said, okay, let's go back to Denmark and that's where we're going to live. So we sold the house in Scotland and we went to live in Denmark. I didn't have a job, couldn't speak Danish, baby on the way, needed, to, you know, needed an income. A friend of mine had a body shop franchise, the skin and hair care franchise. He was doing really well in Aberdeen and I thought I could do that in Denmark. There was one available in Udense, the third largest city in Denmark. So we got the franchise for Udense. This is going to be great. We are going to do so well. That was the plan. So we moved to Udense. We got a great site, really busy street. Unfortunately, the shop fit cost three times plus what we thought it was going to cost. It was an old shop and the price just went through the roof. So I ran out of money overnight. So we went to the bank and we borrowed a ton of money to open the store. That wasn't the plan, but we thought we'll be fine because we're going to be really successful. We'll pay it all back. So after about a year, the bank then said, I'm just going to click this up there. So the bank then said, when are you going to start paying us back the money? I said, well, I can't pay you because I'm just not making enough. And they said, right, no more credit. That's it. So I then went to body shop in Denmark and they said, we'll give you a loan because we believe in you, we believe in the store. 12 months later, they said, when are you going to pay us back? And I said, well, look, I, I can't pay you. In fact, I think I'm in a bit of trouble here. And they said, well, yeah, we can see that. So we've got a plan. We're going to open a second store in a city called Svenborg near Udense. This one is going to be in two levels. It's going to be amazing. It's going to do so well. We're going to finance it. You run it with the other store. So I signed for the second store. It immediately did worse than the first. So now I'm in trouble. I then was told, unless I could pay the money by, back by a certain date, that I was going to have everything taken from me. In effect, I was going bankrupt. The fact is, if I hadn't been going bankrupt, I would not be on the stage with you tonight in the horse and jockey. Because it was at that moment I thought, what would happen if I used the last seven weeks stock I had to give my customers a different kind of service? What would happen if I used that seven weeks to give my team of eight a different kind of leadership from me? But most importantly, what would happen if I looked at myself different? You see, those few years leading up to that, I blamed everybody and everything for where I was. I was really negative. So then what happened was we got rid of the second store. I'm left with the original store and the seven week stock. I went to body shop in Denmark. I said, could I do something different? And they said, we don't care. We're taking the shop back. Do what you want. So I went to my team and I said, look, let's do everything different. They said, we will do what you want. We want to save our jobs. I never set out to create a program called You Are The Difference. Because at that point, I then had two very small children and I needed to save the business 
for the family and for the future. So we did everything different and everything changed. My turnover did that. I put 43% onto my turnover. I went shop manager of the year for Body Shop. Denmark did plus 11, I did plus 43. Would you agree something's going on in my store? Somebody from Body Shop in England, without saying anything to Denmark, came to Denmark to see what was going on because they saw the figures. They said, what are you doing? I said, well, I've got this new idea of working, this new way of uh, uh, customer service and selling, and uh, I'd love to do it in English because Danish is a very tough language. It took me six years to learn Danish. So after a bit of negotiating, and it's all in the book, they took me to London and put me in the biggest store in the world. It's down from Selfridges in Oxford Street. 48 people worked there. That's how big it was. They said, if you can turn around the store, we will put your program into body shop. So I moved to Bedsit in Gloucester Road. I was there for three months. I worked seven days a week with that 48 people and we completely turned it around. I was then asked to roll my program into 950 body shops in the UK. Most of it I did on my own at night with a flip chart in a car, driving up to that town. When the shop shut, I put up the flipboard, get the team out and I do the session. I've calculated, I've done about 3,500 sessions in total in my life. And if you put a pen anywhere in the UK and most of Ireland, I've been there. Two years after that with a body shop, I left and I set up this company. The good news is they bought back my shop. So there was a good ending. So here we are today. We have a team of eight. We've got three coaches in Ireland. We've got five in the UK. And You're the Difference is now in over 24 languages and has been used in over 40 countries across the world. Would you agree if this didn't work, I'd have been found out by now? It does work, but it only works if you do. If you do. And it's really simple. And when you hear it and see it and read about it, you think that's really simple. But would you agree the simple things are sometimes the hardest things to see? And here's the sad thing. Everything I found to turn around my business was there the years I was going out of business. I was like a horse with blinkers. I was never really looking at the opportunity. And I would say this now, in all the companies we work for, there is so much opportunity, but sometimes you need to do things differently, look at things differently, and maybe step outside the comfort zone and try new ideas. So that's what happened, and it's, and it's all true. It's all true. Here's the kind of people we work for. We work in retail, hospitality. We work in banking, car sales, business call centers, hospital care, takeaways, restaurants, and coffee shops. And often when I show this, people think, hospital care? I recently worked in a hospital in England with 6,000 people. I was there for months. Ambulance drivers, porters, doctors, nurses, surgeons. Would you agree that a patient is also a customer? It's all about people. It's all about people. And you're the difference is working in any environment where there's a one-to-one -one interaction because it's about people, behavior, customer service, of course, and there's also selling involved too. Here's some of the people that we work for. You'll notice some of these, a lot of these are Irish companies as well. Um, if you have children, you'll recognize that one up there, Smith's Toys. <laughs> we do all Smith's Toys in the UK, Ireland, Austria, Switzerland, Germany, because they bought Toys R Us. But I'll, you'll see there's lots of large companies and there's some small ones as well. Harry Corey, we've been working with Harry Corey now for the best part of 10 years. They live, you're the difference. It's a part of their culture and they've been very, very successful with it. So what's the purpose of this session tonight? Well, it's to introduce you to the You're the Difference coaching program and provide you with some simple tools to help you empower and lead first-class service culture. That's what it's about. Give you some simple tools to help you to do that in your business. And I don't care what kind of business you come from. There is something in this session for you. I'm sure of it. And sometimes it can just be that one thing that can make the difference. My request is this. Come to this with a positive attitude. Give it 100% and you will see it can work for you. But it will only work for you if you use it. Alison mentioned the book. You're all going to get a copy of the book. We're also going to send you a link through Kathleen of the book online and the audio book. So you can have me in your head <laughs> talking to you. Some people like to learn that way. I quite like audio books. So you, you're going to get that as well. If I draw a picture here like this of 
an iceberg. How much of an iceberg is under the water, roughly? How much? It's about two thirds, yeah, 90%. That's like you are the difference, you see. Under the water, what customers and people can't see is the customer service behavior, techniques, and skills. They're hidden. All you should see if you're doing it properly is friendly, relaxed service. If I asked this question, how many of you like the hard sell? I think you would all say, no, I don't like that either. And I think customers can smell it as soon as somebody tries to do the hard sell. This is more powerful than that because it works around behavior. The techniques have been, they've been really created on a shop floor during thousands and thousands of interactions. This is the only technical pit of you're the difference. This is called the you're the difference principles and behaviors. Here you can see three circles. You can give somebody the how to, you can give somebody the why to, but would you agree if they don't want to do it, the top two circles don't make any difference? Would you agree? And that's where a lot of training programs fall down. They don't deliver the desire, the want to. We believe this program is different because it gives people tools to help them be more confident, help them be more successful and happier in their job. And if you're getting that, then you want to keep doing it. And if you keep doing it, you then develop what we call the you're the difference habit. Do you know your life is full of habits? You've got hundreds of them. A lot of them you don't maybe realize you have because you do them so often and you can create positive habits. It just takes a little bit of time and a bit of work, but it is possible. But this next slide is key because the key to the success of this program in your business is in the room because the team will always follow the manager's lead. The team will always follow the manager's lead. We know how this works. We know how it fails. It always works if the managers and the leaders get behind it and it fails if they don't because the team will follow their lead. This is an interesting statement that the level of the You're the Difference program and the customer service in any store is directly related to the engagement and commitment shown and delivered by the manager. So simply put, if a manager lives customer service and selling here, that's where the team will be. The team aren't going to be there. And if the manager lives it down here, usually that's where the team will be too. And it's very, very difficult to drive great customer service and selling from a back office. There are no customers in there. That's why we spend most of our working lives, and you're the difference, on the shop floor, coaching real time with real people and real customers. Okay, let me just share a story with you now. I like to use stories to get across ideas and, and principles. I'd like you to imagine you've got a day off. Some of you are thinking, what's that? So you've got one of them. You're in a high street and there's all these shops around you and there's something you need to buy. You see a store and you think, they've got it. So you head to the store, you go in, here's the product you want to buy, the price you want to pay, you buy it. Shocking service. It's really bad, but you need it so you buy it. A couple of weeks later, you're off again. You need that product. You're in that high street. You see the store, so you head towards the store and you think, nah. There's another store down here. They've got a similar product, same price. You go in there, you buy it, you get wonderful service. It's really nice. Three months later, you guessed it. You're in that high street. You need that product. Which store would you go to, the first one or the second one? Which one? People always say the second one. Why? Because people buy people first, the product second. People buy people first. Try and think of a time you had great service recently. You might have to think. If you can remember it, you'll probably remember something about the person. It tends to stand out because it's not the norm. In most stores, there is a branding or a name outside the store. But would you agree it's the people who work in the store that give it its name? People buy people. And that's why we call it You're the Difference. And this quote, I think, goes to the heart of this. A customer may not remember what they bought or what it cost, but they will usually remember how they felt. And a feeling is different to a thought. A feeling is something you have inside your body. A thought's like just something in your head. That feeling can be with you for years, bringing you back to that 
store again and again because of that great experience. But I'm often asked this, what is customer service? What is it? And when I was doing work with Tesco's, they said, could you come and tell us at the annual conference what this is? What is customer service? And I thought, well, that's, pretty, that's a pretty big question. So I did what I normally do. I Googled it. You get lots of stuff on Google. And it was loads came up. But this one here is my favorite. Customer service is an attitude, not a department. It's an attitude. Would you agree with that? It's an attitude. It's funny, earlier today, I, was, uh, I, made, I made some uh, film questions that Alison asked me, which you're going to be able to see later on. And one thing we always say is, higher attitude, train skill. It's about attitude. Do you know what will be the most important thing for you tonight in this room with me now? Do you know what that will be? The most important thing for you. Your attitude. You see, as you take part in this session, it's your attitude that will determine what you take from it and what you do with it. Fact. Absolute fact. How many of you in this room talk to yourselves? You all do. Some of you go, no, I don't. Who's that? Who's that talking? Who's that? Do you know how many thoughts you have a day? Minimum 50,000. They're going on all the time. Buy it. No, get it. No, do it. All the time. Try and stop thinking you can't do it. And that's called programming. And when you get my book, you'll see I talk about a book I found, which changed my life. I now have that book framed in my home in Denmark. And it's called Choices by a man called Shad Helmstetter. It's a really old book. And I found it in Sweden. The story of how I found it is completely true just before I turned around my business. And what he talked about there was programming, that noise in your head. See, when you're very small, you don't realize that's going on. But when you get maybe five or six, you start hearing that voice. And that's you talking to yourself. And programming is so important because those thoughts, they create your beliefs. Your beliefs about you, the world around you, your business, all the things going on. Those beliefs come from those thoughts, the programming. And your beliefs then create your attitude around it. And your attitude then creates your feeling towards it, which then creates your behavior around it, which creates your results. And that's why people with a positive attitude tend to get positive results. It's not rocket science. If you want things to change out there, they first of all have to change in here. Because that's where it all begins. It all begins there. Attitude is so important. <laughs> I like this one. A bad attitude is like a flat tire. You can't go anywhere until you change it. It's so true. You just can't. But a positive attitude, with a positive attitude, you see the brighter side of life. You become more optimistic and expect the best to happen. It's a state of mind that's well worth developing. It's so important. Attitude, attitude, attitude. It is so key. But if this is what you're doing in your business, and this is the result you're getting, if you want this result, would you agree this has to change? There's a great saying around this. If we keep doing the same thing, we'll get the same result. We need to think outside the box. You heard of that saying, think outside the box? When you've got to go outside your comfort zone. Do you know you've all got a comfort zone? You know you've got one of those? It's lovely in there. Oh, it's lovely. Nothing grows in there, but it's so nice. And you think, I'm going to step outside it. Whoa, I'm back in again. Don't like that. The comfort zone is like an elastic band. When you stretch it, it never goes back to the same size. But if you never stretch it, it kind of contracts. Now, I was very lucky earlier on. I got the names of everybody that's here tonight. So I've got all the names in here. I'm going to pick out a name. I'll get a chair up in a minute. When I pick it out, I'd like you to kind of stand up. Are you ready? So here we go. She'll be trouble. We'll get somebody else here. <laughs> How many people are thinking, don't pick me? Don't pick me. How many people are getting that kind of little tight feeling in your tummy there? Well, the good news is there's nothing on the paper. I did it for a specific reason. I wanted you to experience the butterfly effect. That's the effect you get when you're about to step outside your comfort zone. You maybe remember the very first day, your first job, you're kind of a bit nervous. That's it. Here's the really amazing thing about this. If you never have that now at work, you're never doing anything new because you're inside your comfort zone. 
You got to catch a butterfly. You got to get out there. Sometimes people are fearful of doing something new. If you think of the word fear, F E A R, it really means future event appearing real because it hasn't actually happened yet. We scare ourselves in our head and we go, No, I'm not doing it. We haven't done it yet. We haven't experienced it, but we stop ourselves. Have you ever been anywhere where somebody says to you, try this new idea, try this new thing? And you think, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then you come to do it and you go, no. We've all done that. Have you ever seen the elephants in the circus go round in a circle, trunk to tail? You see them do that? Bump, bump, bump. They don't make that sound, but that's going on. They do that. Watch what happens. When they want the elephant to stand still, they get a bit of wood, put it in the sawdust, they put a rope around its leg, and it stands there. And you think, why does it do that? It weighs two ton. It doesn't move. It doesn't move because when it was a baby, they chain him up to a tree and let it pull for days on end and it gives up after a few days. It stands there. Anytime later in life as a fully grown elephant, a piece of thread attached to a stick, the elephant will stand there. Why? Because an elephant lets previous behavior affect it later in life. And the reason I give you this story, don't let previous things in the past stop you from trying something new. Maybe some of these things you'll see and experience tonight, you can do them. It's a bit like crossing a little, a little line. And we use this number here, 21. 21 is a very important number. Why? Because they say it takes about three weeks to form a habit. And if you work at something over 21 days, you normally keep doing it. My son, who's now 28, he makes his bed every morning. He didn't when he was 15, so I used to wait in the car and say, I'm not driving until you go back and make your bed. And he used to go back and do it and do it. No, he's an adult. He still makes his bed because he developed a habit around it. He doesn't know he's doing it, but he still does it. It's just a habit. And what we use the 21 days for is when we're doing coaching, we always give people that three-week period to really work at it, to try it, to try it and try it and try it. They might fail now and again, but failure is good because failure gives you feedback. You can never really fail at anything unless you give up. And feedback gives you a different way of looking at it and trying something, something different. We don't have a delete button, so we can actually replace negative stuff with positive stuff, but we work at it. But I like to think of the, the business, the store, a bit like a chain. Imagine this is a, a retail store. In the middle, we've got the customer. Those dots are the links in the chain, all the people working there. How many people in that chain, in that business, affect the customer? They all do. You see, everybody has a part to play. Everybody, including internal customers, people working in the office. It doesn't work if only one or two people do it. The chain breaks. It's so important that everybody is on the same page with this. Because if there's bad customer service, and that can happen, we can create this dangerous person, and they're called the customer complainer. Why are they so dangerous? Well, they tell other people, they say about 10 people, they blow up the story, wait till you hear. They then, you've then gifted the competition with all their money. This is what they say happens. 79% that receive poor customer service will tell their family and friends about their experience. 56% will never shop in that store again. And this is the one here. 36% will share their experience on social media. And then it just goes everywhere. Here's the impact of poor customer service. You create a negative word of mouth. A loss of loyal customers. Loss of potential customers. Loss of reputation. Loss of revenue and profits. And a damage to the brand. But if you give great service... You create these really important people, and they're called the customer champions. Why? Because they tell other people, some say your best form of advertising. They come back again and again and again, and they're worth so much money. How many here in this room has ever gone to a restaurant, a pub, or a hotel, recommended by a family member or a friend? We've all done it. These people create more of themselves through the great service that's given. And we can never know how many people they know and how much they will then spend. They're so valuable. It's a fact on average, loyal customers are worth up to 10 times as much 
as their first purchase. Customers on average spend as much as 10% more when you interact with them and you give them friendly service. That's why the team is so important. Together, everyone achieves more. The team is so key. But would you agree, if you have a retail store, there are other things than customer service to look after. There's something called tasks. There can be a lot of tasks, and tasks can get in the way. But it's also about creating a balance. Sometimes the task can wait. The customer might not. I often like to show this here because, especially in Body Shop, when I was there busily going out of business, I had the most perfect looking shop because I got so involved with keeping it nice. And I always like to show this. I'd like you to imagine that I am working in a store, okay? I'm just going to merchandise this here, okay? I'll just merchandise it here. Okay, I'm now a customer. Oh. I now work in the store. Oh no! Sometimes stuff gets moved, but often this can become the whole focus, keeping it perfect. And what happens is, if that happens and people's heads are down all the time, completely involved in the task, they miss all the opportunities around the customer. Sometimes the task can wait. The customer might not be able to. It's finding that balance. Okay, I'm going to put this slide up. This is called a holding slide because I'm now going to take you into the foundation of your the difference. This is called the spiral of positivity. Some of you have maybe seen it before. You'll always experience it different because life moves on and you get a different aspect in your life. This is key and it had a big effect on my life. It's in the book and this is how it goes. I'd like you to imagine the scene. It's a Monday morning. It's midwinter, very early. You're fast asleep. You're having your favorite dream. Not that one. <laughs> the alarm goes off. You hit the alarm and you think, why is the alarm going off? It's Sunday. Then you remember, it's Monday. You've had the weekend. You've got to get up. Oh, it's freezing. So you open the curtains. It's pouring. So you then go and get what you're going to wear to work. It's in the wash. It's not ironed. Maybe worse. There it is from Friday night. Ugh. Anyway, you get that organized downstairs, in the kitchen, you open up the fridge. Guess what? Who drank all the milk? Black tea, black coffee, dry wheat, a bit's never good. Then you do what a lot of people do in the morning. You put on the radio, the television, you're on the news on your phone. You get your daily dose of the bad news. Get a dose of that. Now you get off to work. Does any of you drive? Ah. Uh -huh. It finally starts. You get the first roundabout, a car cuts right in behind you. Oi! But a road rage. You might take the bus. The bus is full. You're crushed next to this person who had this really strong garlic meal. Oh, God. Or you might walk a bit. We've all got to walk. Somebody's been out with a dog. They didn't pick it up, but you're going to on your shoe. God. Anyway, you finally make it. You get into work. Here's somebody you work with, and you say to them, morning how you doing and they go i've seen the weather it's going to be dead 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 you go through the back there's a couple other people working there they're like this it's going to be dead someone else runs up and says have you seen who just phoned in sick again on a monday i'm telling everyone everyone is now on their way down the spiral then someone else will come up and say have you seen what's out of stock again how come it's always out of stock I'm telling everyone, everyone gets told that. And then there's all the paperwork. Why do they want all the paperwork? I think they take it away and they burn it. I do. You're just now about to close. You're doing a mental countdown. You just want to get home, relax, have your evening meal. You're just about to close. In they come. Customers crash. Now, I've got the team down there at the end of the day. You go into some places, they're down there by 10 o'clock. And the thing that takes us down the spiral is language, stuff we talk about, talk to ourselves about, how we respond to daily events. It doesn't always have to be like that. Imagine you've got a day off. That's another one. You're at home, relaxing, you're watching television, reading a book, you're on your own. Outside, you hear a sound. Doot, doot, doot. You think, what's that? You look out. Here's a big lorry reversing up to your door. You know, it's the noise they make when they reverse. What a smell. All the rubbish from where you live is in the back. The, the lorry parks and this happens. 
but jinx, but you dump all the rubbish on your doorstep. Two options, would you do this? Oh no, back and watch the television, or would you be right outside? Oi, stop! There might be a couple of words between oi and stop. Would you agree you do something about it? Every time I ask an audience to say, of course we would, we'd do something. Okay, let's go back to work. Oh, hi. Really, tell you what, pour it in. Pull that rubbish into my head. Another word for negativity, pour it into the most valuable thing that I own, that you own, our brain. Got us everything we've got, everything we're going to get. What normally comes out of there, if rubbish or negativity goes in there, would you agree the same? Isn't it challenging being positive when all you get is negativity all the time? We've got a word for people that like being negative. We call them negs. You might know a neg. You might work with an egg. You might live with an egg. And all day long, all they do is take you down and down. But often, I've had somebody shout out, Stop! Stop, Alf! You can't help but go down the spiral when that happens, because that's life. Well, here's a really good statement. Nobody can, has, ever choose where you're on that spiral. It's always our choice. And it's all about our attitude. And teams that work hard to be up there, at the top of the spiral, it's a more positive place to work. Customers notice it always has a good effect on sales and would you agree if you take work and sleep there sometimes ain't a lot left so it's good to come to a positive place of work it's all about attitude it's the cornerstone for building success it shapes our ideas our opinions and creates a reality it's infectious it really is it rubs off on people around us it helps us to feel in control gives us confidence and i believe it helps us to see the opportunities around us that we miss often. So at this point, I'm going to give you a little present. I'm going to give you a neg repellent. Would you like one? In case you meet a neg. It's a word. We always give it in the session. You can think it or say it. It's a bit of fun. You're going about your daily life. You're working away. All of a sudden, you see the neg. You know who I mean. And they're coming at you like this. And you know it's all bad. So they get to you. And they give it to you, all that negativity. You can then use the neg repellent. You can think it or say it. All you do is this. Fantastic. This is what they'll do. It does work. See how often it goes off in your head. I was explaining in the session I did uh, this morning in uh, Blanchardstown. We were working with home base in the UK. True story, a couple of years ago. And we did all the head office to begin with. So at about 100 people each day, in the second day, the first lot who had been through the session, who knew about this, were going into a meeting not far from me. I was just about to start the session, and I could hear from the meeting room, fantastic! And there was a bit of laughter, there was a neg in there. It was just enough for somebody to catch themselves. And in a lot of the companies we work with, they've got a big spiral through the back. And they'll maybe put their name on it where they are during the day. Or they'll just say, where are you in your spiral today? It's a great reminder. I was lucky enough for a few months to work with Anita Roddick, who started the body shop, well, one shop. And Anita had a brilliant saying. She called the shop floor a stage. The customer's your audience. The customer service was like a performance. And every day you walk on stage, it's about creating theatre. Customers love to get involved. They love to get involved. They love to be greeted. They love to be interacted with in the right way. And I love that effect. And I remember one of the Smith's Toys managers, he took it to the next level that he had a velvet, red velvet curtain through the back of the store as a reminder to them when they went on the shop floor, they were going on stage. I think it's a really good reminder. But also I believe looking the part helps us to be the part. I think that's also important. Looking smart sends out a positive message. It also is how the customer perceives the overall service. I always say, check yourself before you go out. You know, are you looking like a 10? You know, make that choice. Look the part. Here are the techniques, the selling and service techniques within you are the difference. And when you get the book, you'll be able to read how I developed these, found these. They're not in any other coaching program. There are key techniques, you can see them there. The greeting, how you can greet a customer and learn something about them. It's not in any other coaching program, it works around behavior. 
you can actually discover if the customer is okay or they need some help just by greeting them. How do you approach a customer? Approaching a customer in a nice, relaxed way. I always say when I'm doing this with the sales teams, would you agree if I tried to give you a technique that you would not like used on you, you wouldn't do it? And they say, no, we wouldn't. All of this is how you would love to be treated as a customer. How you can interact with the customer to talk around the products they're looking at. And then the, the technique that helps save my business, it's called Perfect Partners. We had something in Body Shop called Link Selling. I didn't like it because it was pushy. And I developed this, which is nice and gentle. It's about how to introduce a product that complements one the customer's buying. If you have a retail store, your customers probably only know or see 20 to 25% of what you have. You've got all these other products they don't know about. Perfect Partners helps you to do that. It's a really powerful technique. Closing the sale is a question that will not only close the sale, it can also give you an extra sale. That's for the shop floor. And then, all important, fab five at the till, the last impression. Because if you go in a store and you get good service on the shop floor and you go to the till and it's bad, what do you tend to remember? The last thing. So important. But it's about creating a positive learning environment for people to grow and develop. Learning and development is not an automatic process. People need support. We can plant the seed, give them the You Are The Difference coaching program, but for it to grow, the conditions need to be right. So we use something called the watering the seed. Using the 21 day principle, giving people 21 days to practice the techniques. Using something called the five stages of coaching, which I'll come to in a second. Talking about you're the difference every day keeps it alive. Always talking about it during meetings, about how it's working, what's doing well, how they're going to be using it. And as a manager or leader, leading by example, would you agree you can't ask your team to do something that you don't do? We all need to do it. You don't need to be the best, but you need to lead with it. And really importantly, celebrate in best practice. So important. But how we feel, how we feel when we come to work does dictate in many ways how we perform. It really, really does. I'm going to use a story here to illustrate this. I'd like you to imagine now that you all work for me, okay? Welcome. This is your first night in the new job. You've all got the job. I'm going to be sending you out now to the, all the, the towns and villages around here to sell this new service. You're a bit nervous. You've got the butterflies, but you're going to give it a go. So you go out and you start knocking on doors. After a couple of hours, a door opens and someone says, we need that, get in, get in. They start working out the order. You realize this could be one of the biggest orders we will ever get. Your heart's pumping, yes, yes, yes. First day, wow. They say to you, we'll call you tomorrow to confirm. You now rush back here. On a scale of one to 10, one is low, 10 is great. How do you feel? 11, would you agree? Yes. You're going to do a talk to six people that evening or that day. You've done it before. How's it going to go? Brilliant. Probably the best one you've ever done. Anyway, you come in the next day, phone call comes in. Bless you. Oh, they've given the order to somebody else. How do you feel on a scale of one to ten? You've got to do the talk again. How's it going to go? Maybe not so well. You see, there is a real connection to how we feel, to how we behave, to the results we get. I don't know many teams that can come in one or two and get a ten result. What would happen if the team came in seven or eight, but the manager's coming in one or two? Where's the team going to be? That question you ask yourself as you come into work every morning, how do I feel, could be the most important question you ask because it can have a massive effect on your team around you. Because as a manager, you set the tone for the day every day. And the first thing you say can be so important. If I took a big balloon like this, filled it with air, put a knot in it and I put it in the corner and we come back in two weeks time, what would the balloon look like? Deflated. You see, that's like motivation. It never lasts. You've got to keep putting the air in the balloon. I used to kind of explain it a bit like this. Did you ever see the person, it used to be on the London Palladium, they'd be spinning plates on wood. You know, they have sticks with the plates spinning. That's kind of how it is. As a manager, you know, 
catching your team doing something really well and praising them and going in and coaching them and really being there for them all the time. You've got to keep putting air in that balloon. And when I was in London with the body shop, turning around that big store, that's what I did. Because there were 48 people, I went around catching them red-handed, doing something good. And then I praised them. Guess what they then did? They did it again. So I caught them again, praised them. Guess what they then did? Did it again. And then what happened is they then created the habit. This is very important, this. As a manager or a leader, it's important. What does good look, feel, and sound like in your business, in your store, in terms of service? Staff need to always have a clear picture of what it is they're expected to do. Everybody should be on the same page in your business. What is great service and selling for us? What does that look like? What does that feel like? And what does that sound like? And the reason I say look, feel, and sound, because people learn in three different ways. Some people through, through auditory, some through visual, and kinesthetics, the feeling one. If everybody's on the same page, you've got a chance of hitting the target. If not, how can you hit a target if they're all on different pages? It's really important. What does good or should look like, feel like, and sound like if it's all going really well in your business around service? And this is why coaching is key. Here's three weeks and three months. If you just tell somebody something, they say they recall 70% after three weeks, 10% after three months. If you tell them and show them, it goes up to 85% after three weeks and then 35% after three months. But if you tell them, show them, and they physically experience it, 95% after three weeks, 75% after three months, it's in the doing. And this is the model that we use all the time. We use a model called the five stages of coaching on the shop floor, discreetly observing a member of the team with a customer. Once that interaction's over, we ask them how it went. They would then talk through how it went with the customer. We would then ask them the magic question, what they would do different next time. Can anybody tell me why that's a good question? What would you do different next time? Why is that a good question? <coughs> They'll learn from it, yeah? They reflect on what they did. Because if they've missed something, would you agree they maybe, they usually know? And that's why, if you could do it again, what would you do different next time? And we often get answers like, uh, yeah, I could have shown the perfect partner. Or I could have closed the sale with the, 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 the question we use. Coaching isn't about giving people the answers. It's about helping them to find them themselves. Only then would we make a suggestion and praise them. But you can also self-coach yourself as a manager or leader. And I really like this. And I do this all the time after sessions. At the end of the day, you can ask yourself, how did the day go? How did it go? How, how it went? Then ask yourself, what could you do even better next time, tomorrow? What's one thing you could do better? And then give yourself a bit of praise. If you do that every day, and you come up with that one thing, and you do that thing every day, I guarantee in 21 days, you'll be at a completely different level. And after every one of these, I will go through the slides, and I will find something I can make better, or move around, or improve on. When I did that hospital, I was there for two months, every day doing sessions. So you can imagine the amount of sessions. The last one, I nailed it. <laughs> I got the last one absolutely perfect. I changed it every single day till I got to the end. I thought, that's it. Just a tiny little thing every day. In the audience is Helen England. Helen is my lead coach sitting there. Helen's been with me 19 years, and she spends all her time on shop floors, coaching you're the difference. All around Ireland, all around the UK. So Helen's here. If you want to talk to her later about coaching, she is the person. She, she Helen's local. She lives in Nina. Yeah, yeah. The watering of the seed. Give them three weeks. Use the five stages of coaching. Talk about it. Lead by example and celebrate best practice. Now, in this session tonight, I've talked about opportunity. I've also talked about what you think about is what you tend to see. So I'm going to click on this and you're going to see some letters going across the screen. I want you just to say 
to yourself what you see or read or say out loud. What do you read? Opportunity is nowhere. What do you read now? Isn't that amazing if I just move the white space, how everything changes? Your opportunity is now here. Do nothing with this, nothing will change. Use this and it will make a difference. Remember the elephant, you've got to make it happen. You've got to take action. Doing nothing, nothing will happen. You've got to take action. And remember that about the level of service in any store is a direct mirror of where the manager is with that service and selling in the store. The team will always follow the manager's lead, always. That's where it all begins. At the end of tonight, you will get a copy of the book. We're also going to be sending you the audio book as well as a link. The book is a really good reference to everything I've covered tonight. It goes into great detail. And there's also loads of stuff on the website as well. And if you have any questions or queries, I'd be delighted to hear from you. But I'm going to finish on another story. Um, because at the end of a session like this, sometimes people can go away and they think, well, that was great. That was good. Like the spiral. Yeah, some good ideas in there. But then they think to themselves, can I do it? Can I do this? Well, if that thought comes into your mind, then maybe the story will help you, even in the future. Okay. I'd like you to imagine that you all now work for me. Again, welcome to the team. You're going to be asked to go out there to sell this amazing product round the doors. This normally retails for 400 euros, but we've got a job lot from an unknown source. Thanks, Kathleen. And we're going to be selling them for just 100. How many of you could go out there and sell 400 over the next four weeks? And I'll give you a euro for every one. Hands up. Okay, I got one. Okay, I died a death. Okay. Here's an envelope. Inside this envelope is a banker's draft. Your name's on it. It's as good as cash. Take it to the bank to give you the money. How many of you could go out there and sell the 400 over the next four weeks? And I'll give you this. And it's made up for 50,000 euros. Hands up. Now, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. When I said a euro, you thought, no, I can't do it, I can't do it. When I said 50,000, you didn't think, how are you going to do it? You were going to do it. Some of you thought, I'll buy them all myself. <laughs> so here's another envelope. This envelope's got a different amount in it, but your name's on it. It's made up for 100,000. You can have it if you can sell the 400, and you cannot buy any yourself. Could you do it? Yes. You see, the difference between the first question and the envelopes is the desire in the room changed. Sometimes in life, you don't need to know how you're going to do something. If you have the desire, you will find a way. We don't always need to know exactly how to fully achieve something. If you have the desire, you will find a way. So when you leave here tonight, think about what is your desire for your business? Are you willing to step outside your comfort zone? Be that difference. Make the difference. Thank you all very much. Thank you.